all of you to the house of God for our worship service this morning, both in person and online. We are glad that God has brought us here and uh, let us now prepare our hearts in silence to enter into God's presence to worship Him. The call to worship this morning is taken, is taken from Psalms 57, verses 9 to 11. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our Almighty God, among all the peoples we want to come to give you our thanks. Among the many people groups, we want to come to give you our praises. Because your faithful love to, for us is as great as the distance from the earth to the sky. May our lives and deeds be used to show in the heavens that you are great and to show your glory to people all over the earth. May your spirit fill this place with your mighty presence. May he speak to us and illuminate our understanding. Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to obey your word and behold the wondrous things you have done. May you be pleased with our worship this morning. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Just a gentle reminder that uh, in uh, following the restriction uh, in this uh, second stage of reopening, uh, congregational singing is actually not allowed. So you can mouth out you know, uh, the songs that you sing or you can sing from your hearts but the no audible singing is actually allowed at this stage. Good morning, everyone. We welcome everyone here, uh, whether you're joining us in person or online. Um, as Pastor Fang said, um, with the restrictions uh, still in effect, uh, we unfortunately can't hear your lovely voices, but we know that God will listen to us even as we sing um, in our hearts. So I just invite you guys to, to follow along and unfortunately, as I said, I, we can't listen to your lovely voices, but we know that our Heavenly Father still appreciates and still loves the, the, um, the worship that we present to Him, even in our hearts. Um, so let's sing the first couple of songs. Um, yeah, let's invite you guys to, to stand, and uh, let's sing a few songs to, to worship God. <laughs> Every grain of sand, kings and nations. 
What a the beauty demands such praises. What a the splendor it does What a the majesty rules with justice. Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. What of the glory consumes like fire? What of the power can raise the dead? What of the name remains undefeated? Only a holy Thank you, worship team. Now it's time for us to agree one another, both in person and online. Uh, let us just wave at each other or give each other a virtual hug or a distant hug for us in worshiping in person. Okay. You can also key in a few words of greetings to those who are worshiping with us uh, uh, through the YouTube channel. Right? You can key in a few words. Them. I 
I guess it will take us uh, some time to get used to it. And by the time we are used to it, uh, we will be likely open for uh, full open worship in September, hopefully, prayerfully. Let us continue to pray for that. Let me refer you to the church bulletin for the announcement. As I mentioned, please continue to uh, pray for God's healing and a quick resume of our normal church life. And prayerfully uh, in September this year. Uh, before I forget, uh, blessed Father's Day to all fathers. Okay, and pray that uh, all God's richest blessing be upon you on this day. Uh, continue to remember the search for the youth and uh, young adult co-worker. Continue to pray uh, for the search and for all the uh, candidates, uh, all, not candidates, sorry, all the applicants that will be applying uh, for the position. All those uh, brothers and sisters who wish to participate in uh, in-person worship service, and I, actually I'm talking to those who are worshipping online uh, as well. Those who wish to participate in our in-person worship service, please remember to follow the requirements of uh, pre-registration, that is with the link sent one week uh, before the worship service, uh, wearing a face mask and observing the six feet uh, social distancing. And I, I have already mentioned it earlier, for those who are here in person, please be reminded that uh, congregational singing is not allowed at this stage of a reopening. Right. Registration and waitlisting for the Vacation Bible School are now closed. If you have a further question, you can email vixiac vbs at gmail.com But in the meantime, continue to pray for these children that will be attending the uh, Bible school and uh, for the uh, VBS planning team as well. The 2021 Alliance Joint Mission Convention will be held online on July the 2nd to the 3rd. It will feature speakers of all three languages, Cantonese, uh, Mandarin and English, and meeting international workers from all regions. The team is uh, X18, that is A18, our DNA, focusing on the Christian and Missionary Alliance DNA of deeper life and global missions, particularly in the making of Christ-centered spirit-empowered and mission-focused uh, disciples. Everyone is encouraged to uh, join the Joint Mission Convention. Please uh, register early for it. Registration is free and it only takes less than a minute. I think it was less than 30 seconds to register. Uh, the link is uh, given uh, uh, in the bulletin or you can search under the website itself, there is a ccaca.org for registration. Right. The mission department is also bringing the unfinished story mission course to fellowships uh, via Zoom. If you're interested, please contact your fellowship leader to join with the fellowship to participate. If you have further questions, you can email mission at victoriacac.ca. Now, if you have not updated your email address, please do so uh, as soon as possible because all future correspondence will be uh, communicated through, the, through our email network. Right. Let us now prepare our hearts uh, and continue with our worship uh, with our tithes and offering. Now, there will be no collection of offering. Instead, Please put your offering in the envelope provided and drop it into the little chapel box. Okay, and 
as you leave your century, leave the sanctuary through the side door, right? Uh, just a note of a reminder as well, as you leave the, serv the service, uh, uh, kindly proceed through this side door or in, a, in an orderly manner and out into the, out to the church, out from the church through that uh, side door, okay, um, on my side here, right? Uh, Please uh, try to avoid, um, um, I don't know what the word to use, interacting with each other because we need the time to prepare uh, for sanit sanitization as the members from the Mandarin service will come into um, this worship hall, right? We have only 15 minutes, okay, um, for that uh, process. So remember, 1 Peter 4, 8 to 10 says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our loving God, we, we come now to honour you with our tithes and offering. We pray, Lord, that you use our offering, Lord, however much it is, Lord, uh, to extend your kingdom, Lord. We ask that you use it for your glory and for the sake of your kingdom. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. I'll give you some time to prepare uh, for the offering and put it into the envelope. Right. waiting for the technology to work. <laughs> While well, research suggests that first impressions are solidified in only seven seconds, with such a brief time to make a judgment on someone, there is little doubt that at some point in life we have failed to correctly evaluate a stranger. Misjudgment is an understatement for a decision made by one of Decker Records employees back in 1962. Dick Rowe, the head of talent acquisition at Decker, was making a choice between two young groups that were each hoping to be signed for a record deal. The choice was made and the band selected Brian Poole and the Tremolos went on to garner great sales for Decca. The band had a number of covers that made their way to the top of the charts in the United Kingdom during the 60s. The band that was overlooked for Brian Poole and the Tremolos became known as the Beatles. Okay, if uh, some of you would remember, right? All right, there you go. A few years after the Beatles were passed over, Paul McCartney commented on Rowe's decision. I bet he's kicking himself, to which John Lennon added, I hope he kicks himself to death. Okay. Have you ever made a poor judgment concerning someone that you would later come to respect? 
how do you how do we evaluate if someone is successful or not? How do we evaluate if the church ministry is successful or not? This morning we come to the end of the first section of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, where he presents to us an accurate way to evaluate a minister, a church leader, or anyone involved in church ministry. Right? Before we begin with the passage proper, let us go into uh, the context and some of the background that we have touched on. In 1 Corinthians, right, Corinthians 3, 1 to 4, Paul delivers a stern rebuke stating the problem in the church at Corinth as spiritual immaturity. And Paul is unable to speak God's wisdom to the Corinthians because they are too immature, too unspiritual to handle it. Their immaturity is evident in the in, uh, inability to consume the solid food of teaching and doctrine and in the factions and the, the division which exists in the church and which centered upon certain leaders. In 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 17, Paul shows us that through the analogies of the farm, the building and the temple, that the church can unite and grow when each and every member does his part or role working together as a team. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 23, Paul calls for the Corinthians to repent and change their thinking and their actions regarding wisdom and regarding their leaders. And continuing from chapter 4, Paul instructs them how they and the church leader should be regarded. Church leaders are to be regarded as faithful servants and stewards. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 uh, to verse 5 reads as such. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am, I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, that is, during the time of the day of judgment. Uh, where everybody will be judged on the beamer throne okay, uh, for rewards. Before the, land, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his commendation from God. The Corinthian Christian had chosen for themselves their favourite leader, whom they elevated to the place which rightly belongs only to our Lord Jesus Christ. Speaking for himself and for the other apostles, Paul seeks to change their perception of God-approved leaders. Paul would like the Corinthian Christians to regard them as faithful servants and stewards. Paul used two different words to describe the apostles in verse 1. And they show the contrast of the relationship the apostles had with God and also the relationship they had with the church. The, fir the first word is huperetes, translated as servants. Right. K. 
came from the description of a partic particular Roman slave. On the great galley ships used for war, these slaves rowed the ship. They were positioned on the lower deck of the ship, and hence they were called huperetes, which literally means under rowers, that is, under the deck and rowing with the oars. They were called under rowers, literally. These slaves labor only as the master directed. I'm sure that you have seen some of the Roman uh, movies where it's been portrayed all the slaves, they were actually chained together under the deck rowing okay, as fast as possible under the direction of the slave master, in a sense. Right? Paul felt that he and the other apostles did only as God directed them as his servants. In a sense, every Christian needs to see himself or herself in this relationship with God, whatever our position in the ministry. The second word Paul used is oikonomos. Oikonomos. I'm sure that uh, the first part of this word is familiar to most of us. If you go into Walmart and you go, I think, Superstore, I don't think Costco has it, you will see the oikos yogurt. That is the first word here, oikos, okay? A form of the word oikos and nomos, okay? Oikos meaning house, and nomeo, the second word of it is actually distribu uh, distributes. So it's a house distributor. And the English word economy actually comes from this word as well, oikonomos or oikonomia. Okay, that is economy. This word means steward. It was translated as steward. In contrast to the under rower, the steward okay, was a slave with great authority and large or huge responsibility in the household, having to direct activities and to make decisions. Paul also felt that he and the other apostles had been given authority by God to preach the gospel, that is, handling the mysteries of God and to give leadership in the churches. In this role, they were accountable to God for how they handle their responsibility. Hence, the Corinthian Christian must take their leader off the display pedestal on which they have placed him or her. Because even apostles are just men who have been chosen and appointed by God to be his servants and stewards. And Paul gave a marvellous criterion for evaluating God's servant and steward, and that is, they be found faithful. Some version translated it as trustworthy. Faithful or trustworthy. Then Paul, in verses 3 and 4, pursues the matter of the judgment as God's steward. He's conveying to the Corinthian Christian the inherent weaknesses in human judgment. Paul informs them that he is not overly influenced by the judgment of his faithfulness to his calling as an apostle. He does so not by directly attacking their ability to judge him, but rather by pointing out his own limitation in judging himself. If Paul cannot rely completely on his own self-evaluation, then how can he be heavily influenced by the judgment of the Corinthian Christian, whose knowledge of Paul is much more limited? Paul can search his conscience to see if there is something worthy of an indictment. 
But even if his conscience gives him a clean bill of spiritual health, his conscience may be ill-informed. Con consequently, the only one who is completely qualified to judge Paul is his master, our Lord and Master, our God. It is the Lord who evaluates him. If human judgment is fallible, then Paul can rightly instruct the Corinthian Christian to refrain from making final judgment, which should be left to God. This he does in verse 5. He says, Therefore, therefore, the word there indicates that the instruction Paul gives here are the conclusion of his argument in verses 1 to 4. When he says, do not pronounce judgment, we know that the Corinthians are actually passing judgment. And Paul is instructing them to stop doing so. And continuing from verse 6 to 13, Paul instructs the Corinthian Christian how they should be regarded. Coming to our third point here is that all Christians are to be regarded as how humble servant. How are the Christian to be regarded? All Christians are to be regarded as humble servants. In this passage, there is an amazing mixture of ideas and emphases. We shall divide this passage into two sub passages for our meditation. First, 1 Corinthians 4, 6-7. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up, that is, becoming proud, in favour of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Now, the real problem at Corinth is not between any of the apostles or their alleged followers. The real problem is divisions and cliques which centered about others. So in verse 6, Paul used how they are being regarded to illustrate to the Corinthian Christian the foolishness of attaching themselves to one particular leader while opposing the rest. He does this for their sake in order that they may learn to live and judge according to what is written in the scripture, which in turn will keep them from boasting in one particular leader over and above another. The passage continues to give us a graphic description of how the Corinthians look at themselves and in contrast, how they look at Paul and his fellow apostles. The puffed-up state, that is the prideful state of the Corinthian Christian, meant that there was a pride problem. Paul addresses the proud hearts with three questions. First, the first question Okay. For, who, for who sees anything different in you? Now, this is a little bit, you know, uh, awkward, okay. Uh, at the first instant, you may not get the meaning of it, but the New American Standard Bible is clearer in its interpretation. It says, for who regards you as superior? 
For who sees anything different in you? The answer is, if there is a difference between us, it is because of what God has done in us. So there is no reason for us to be proud. Second, what do you have that you did not receive? The answer is, everything we have has come from God. So there is no reason at all for being proud. Third, if then you receive it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? The answer is, if what you have spiritually is a gift from God, why do you glory in it as if it were your own accomplishment? There is no reason at all for this self-glorifying pride. Paul knew that pride could be so divisive in the life of the church and that humility had a way of drawing people together. Christians who live with a sense of gratitude for God's grace could deal in a harmonious way with the most uncertain situation in life. The second sub-passage, 1 Corinthians 4, 8-13, contains one of the most sarcastic statements in all of Paul's writings. By divine inspiration and enablement, Paul virtually reads the mind of his audience. Paul reads the minds of the Corinthian Christian and describes ironically the way they look on themselves. The way they look on themselves. I shall read it in the uh, translation, sorry, the translation for translators version. It's called the TFT version, okay? Uh, if you're interested, I'll tell you where to look for it. Okay, uh, this version actually fully expresses these ironies in all Paul's sarcasm, sarcasm, sorry, sarcasm, right? Let me read that version from verses 8, yeah, to, um, to 13 for you. The TFT version. Uh, do not be this uh, alarm actually by the kind of language. It actually expresses uh, quite literally and quite aggressively, okay, uh, the sarcastic statement that Paul is making. Verse 8, It is disgusting that you act as though you have already received everything that you need spiritually. You act as though you were spiritually rich. You act as though you had already begun to rule as kings with Christ. Well, I wish that you really were ruling with him in order that we apostles might also rule with you. But it seems as though God has put us apostles on display like prisoners at the end of the victor's parade. We are like men who have been condemned to die, who have been put in the arena where everyone can see the wild animals killing them. And not only people, but even angels all, all over the world are watching us as people watch those who are performing a play in a theatre. Many people consider us to be fools because we preach about Christ. But you, you proudly think that you are wise because of your close relationship with Christ. Many people consider us to be unimpressive, but you... You proudly think that you impress others. People respect you, but they do not respect us. Up to this present time, we have often been hungry. We have often been thirsty. We have, re we have ragged clothes. Often we have been beaten. We, we have traveled so much that we have no regular homes to live in. We work very hard to earn a living. 
When we are cursed by people, we ask God to bless them. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered by people, we reply kindly to them. Up to now, unbelievers consider us to be worthless, as though we were just garbage. Paul is trying to con contrast the Corinthians' pride and arrogance and feeling of superiority with the way that he himself has functioned in his relationship with them. And he rebukes the Corinthians for forgetting all the sacrifices the apostles had made in their behalf. This passage gives us one of the finest pictures of the difficulties that the apostles face. Paul lives in words that show the price that he had to pay to be a faithful steward of the gospel. It is a story of danger. Now back to the English Standard Version. It is a story of danger in verse 9 as men sentenced to death. It is a story of ridicule, a spectacle to the world. It is a story of contempt, fools for Christ's sake. It is the experience of being deprived. We hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. Paul called himself a homeless person, by the way. <laughs> okay. But we live in homes, right? And while going through all of this in order to preach the gospel, Paul was supporting himself by the work of his own hands. As we read Paul's description of his suffering, I wonder how many people would be faithful to Christ today if they were the po if there were the possibility of that cost for us to pay. Moving to our last point, church leaders are to be regarded as spiritual parents. Church leaders are to be regarded as spiritual parents. As Paul brings the entire discussion of disunity in the church to a close, he makes a strong appeal for unity on the basis of his unique relationship with the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 4, 14 to 17 reads, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you, then, be imit imitators of me. That is why I send you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. And Paul closes this part of the letter with a warning. 1 Corinthians 4, 18-21 reads, Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love in the spirit of gentleness? Obviously, the, our choice is clear, right? There is in verses 14 to 17 a warm fatherly admonition for the majority and in verses 18 to 21, a stern rebuke for the few causing trouble in the church. We get the feeling that Paul was trying to compensate for the harsh tones of the sarcasm and irony in the previous passage. 
The analogy that Paul used to distinguish himself from all the others who had played a part in the spiritual pilgrimage was the difference between a guide and a parent. In his use of my beloved children, we see his feelings of love and tenderness for the Corinthian Christians. Paul, functioning as a spiritual father, calls upon his paternal relationship with them as a basis for unity. The word guide translated is translated different ways in various Bible versions, sometimes as tutor and at other times as instructor. It was usually used of a slave who was responsible for guiding the conduct of a child from age, from age six to manhood, from six year old to manhood. He was usually an older and most trusted most trusted slave who not only delivered the child to the school each day, but guided the child in the development of his character and his lifestyle. A child might have any number of guides of this sort in the process of growing up. When Paul wrote, though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. He was exaggerating for emphasis, but the point was well made. Just as a child might have many instructors or guides, but he only has one father. So the Corinthians might have many people who would help them as they mature in the Christian faith, but they would have only one spiritual father, and that was Paul. There is a special bond that God created between spiritual parents and the children. And it is a wonderful basis for unity. And we, and we urge you to imitate Paul's God's approved servanthood and stewardship in uniting our church, walking our Christian life as one people. May God help us to do that, to walk as one. Let us all imitate Paul's God-approved servanthood and stewardship. Let us pray. Father God, we, we thank you for speaking to our hearts and we thank you for the Father's love on this special Father's Day. Lord, we thank you for the rebuke and the discipline, Lord, that you have for us. Help us to cleanse our lives of whatever introduces the sense of uh, uh, super satisfaction with ourselves, of complacency and pride. Teach us to help one another, to love one another, to understand that you are doing all this to bring fullness and beauty and life and laughter into our, our experience. We thank you for it. In the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Pastor Peng. Um, the the Rasant song that uh, we'll be sort of we'll be singing uh, is Humble King, and I think it's a, a good reminder for uh, for us to imitate God, uh, imitate Jesus, in humbling ourselves uh, despite. Uh, Wanting the, wanting the other, I guess. I think the temptation is always to elevate ourselves instead of um, lowering ourselves. Um, so as we go through this song, and uh, let's, uh, let's meditate on that message of being humble and 
uh, being known as faithful servants to God.
remain standing and receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Be seated, please. After a moment of uh, silent prayer and meditation, you may be dismissed. Please remember the protocol as you leave through the side door. <laughs>